Welcome to Chris Shocklad Live. Today we're going to talk about Ray Manzarek and the second album of The Door, Strange Days. If you're joining us on a replay, welcome. Um, if you're on live, go ahead and if you got questions, you can drop them in the chat room. Steve Alloy here is joining me. Hey everybody, how you doing? So Always glad to talk about The Door. So. <laughs> we uh, talked about them about a week ago, or no, a couple weeks ago, mm -hmm. we were talking about Jim Morrison. I think both of us were, after after kind of diving into Jim Morrison, wanted to talk about Ray because mm -hmm. it seemed like he was more key at keeping the band together and forming the band The Doors mm -hmm. than even Jim Morrison, even though he's the mm -hmm. iconic face of, of The Doors. And that's, that's, I think, the interesting thing about Ray is is the when most people think of The Doors, they think of Jim Morrison, they think of his on-stage performance, they think of his, his image, his legend, really. But when you look at how, how The Doors started, uh, how they got famous, how they performed, and really how their music has lasted, it's really a story of Ray Manzarek. <laughs> you know, it's really, it's less about Jim Morrison than it is really about Ray keeping, you know, getting it started. And keeping it together, so I think uh, I think in many ways, uh, and and creating that sound too, which we're going to talk quite a bit about uh, about his keyboard sound. Uh, I think in many ways, Ray, the Doors is a Ray Manzarek group that featured Jim Morrison. Yeah, yeah. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to come up with ten questions to ask um, Ray Manzarek, and from that, hopefully, we learn a little bit more about the Doors and. Mr. Manzarak himself. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you had mentioned last time, this is when, when, when did you first start listening to The Doors? I started listening to The Doors, um, their first album, I was, it was came out in the beginning of 67, I think, and I yeah, sure. probably listened to it at some point that year. Um, I was, or at some point probably, it might have even been 68, uh, but I was 11 years old when I first heard The Doors. Uh, I had not yet turned 12, I was going to turn 12 in 68, but... Uh, I was 11 years old, and shortly after, not the first time I heard The Doors, but uh, shortly after the first time I heard The Doors, uh, a friend of mine and I um, broke into some wine and, uh, and some alcohol and stuff, and we, we got good and drunk listening to The Doors' first album. And so I was glad to see this one come out, too, because it was you know, another good one as well. So We have it up on the, you can see it on the, on the mantle there, too, but this is, mm -hmm. uh, I just picked this up at Homer's from Omaha. Oh wow! Cool. So that was, that was cool. cool. Good to yeah. see it's still around. It's still mm -hmm. around. This is the hot you get the cool insert. Yeah, they used to, the albums used to have these great inserts, and some would have um, whole booklets with them, and you know, just cool stuff. So when you were eleven, is this what you would have pulled out? Yeah, yeah, I would have pulled out the the vinyl because that was that was what we had. That was all we had uh, back then. Other than real, we did have reel to reel, which <laughs> if you've ever. <laughs> Try to listen to music on real to real. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Sound was good, but oh boy, so much could go wrong. Yeah, well, that's now I I like listening to vinyl, but I'm not only vinyl. Like I like mm -hmm. there's times when I'm I'm very happy just to get on. Um, I use Apple Music. I like getting on Apple Music and just finding, especially if I haven't if I don't at first recognize the band or I'm not quite sure if I want to get the album. Right, go on there oh, yeah. and listen to it, sense. and then and then it's like, oh, okay, this sounds really good. Mm -hmm. Then the question is, is is the vinyl album gonna be? Is the only way I can really get this music through vinyl? Is it better? Can I get like a super audio? What's the best way to listen to this? And so right. I'm, right. I'm willing to compromise on. Well, you know, I think now I mostly do. Uh, I mostly listen to streaming. Um, I'm typically, I'm more of a Spotify, but I, I typically I'll, I'll listen on streaming. And it's a lot of it, you know, it's very similar, but uh, there is a certain different sound to the vinyl. Uh, something to do about the, the drag of the needle, and it, it's a little bit, little bit different sound that actually, I think, is, is accentuated and, and makes particularly rock and roll, particularly blues-based rock and roll, uh, more interesting on vinyl. I think it is a little bit more interesting. It's not that it's not good. It's great streaming. That's how I mostly hear it now, but the vinyl did add a little something to it. I think vinyl is more of a commitment where you're, all right, I'm going to listen to this album right now mm -hmm. and I'm going to take the time to just kind of be present and listen to this music and listen to this album all the way through. And that mm -hmm. part of it is very yeah. enjoyable as well because you know, you're 
you're taking time to listen. Mm -hmm. And I agree, the sound, the sound most part is true. I think some of the modern vinyl albums, you can get in trouble if they, if it's a bad pressing or bad, if it's a bad, it is, yeah. If it was made to be listened to on little speakers and now you put it on really big speakers, sometimes Mm -hmm. you can get in trouble. But by and large, especially if if you're listening to a 1960s Doors Mm -hmm. album, and it's close to the original, or if it's in its original format, it's you're probably gonna have, you may have a, I think you're probably gonna have a better listening experience on oh, the yeah. equipment that was designed to be listened for. Oh yeah, and this, I mean, some of the music of that era, of the '60s, uh, more like the early '60s. I'm thinking of like the Phil Spector Wall of Sound. A lot of times you listen to that on really great equipment, and you're you're thinking, why was this so big? I mean, it's an interesting song. It's okay, but I don't get that that wall of sound because it was designed to be listened on AM car radios. Well, right. This was not, this was designed to be really listened to on equipment that barely existed at yeah. that time. Yeah. So and, now yeah. you hear this like, Oh no, I understand this, why this is still around. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that kind of, I mean, that gets into some of the questions I have on, I uh, want to, I would like to ask, mm-hmm. um, Ray Manzarak on, on, technology Uh, what's your first so what we want to do here today and we've done this on a couple episodes is we're going to come up with 10 questions that we would like to ask Ray Manzarak and the questions aren't as important as how we get to that question Mm -hmm. so we're going to use some Socratic method and maybe improv to figure out what's the truth behind this maybe we learn a little bit more about our our favorite artists here well, in some of the questions, you may have to struggle to figure out the exact question. I mean, sometimes they're more like discussion points, but I think you'll like them. Because the uh, question's often more important than the answer. Oh, oh absolutely. Because some of these, there really is not an answer because we don't have Ray, unfortunately, anymore with us. He died uh, about six years ago at this point, so we don't have him to ask these questions anymore. Uh, and I have not gone uh, analog uh, vinyl on my questions. I, I've gone digital, so I, I will have to keep looking at my phone here. But um, one of the questions, I guess one thing that I would, I'd would i probably want to get out of the way with Ray right away, and I, I think I know the answer to this. I don't think this would be a problem for him. But, uh, you know, as I said at the, at the outset, uh, in many ways, I think The Doors is his group uh, that featured his friend. I mean, they'd known each other for several years before they formed the doors, uh, featured his friend Jim Morrison, but in many ways he determined, he set the sound, he got the got things going. Jim Morrison did give him the name. Ray at first thought it was a stupid name, but uh, what's the interesting the doors of perception? He goes, oh no, okay, I like that now. Now that's a good, this suddenly became a good name. And it'd be like, let's call ourselves the wash machines. Yeah, I mean, he just said, well, that's, that's first, a dumb first name. first reaction was, this is the dumbest name I've ever heard. And he goes, oh wait, you mean like doors of perception? Like, uh, oh yeah, yeah, okay, all right. Well, I'm good with that then. But, <laughs> you know, because of that, because it's he was course, so like a storm door. Uh, like, yeah, I mean, he thought like the door, like you walk in, it's like, you know, come on. You know. <laughs> but, you know, in part because he was, he was really the guiding force in a lot of that. Uh, m- when most people think of the doors, they think of Jim Morrison. Did that ever bother Ray? Uh, did that ever bother you that, you know, Jim Morrison got the attention? And this was not driven by Morrison. In fact, he, um, Ray t- tells a story on, actually it's a spoken word album that I would recommend if you really want to hear more, much more about Ray Manzarek. Uh, it's called uh, Ray Manzarek, uh, The Myth and the Reality. And it was actually re-released as The Doors, The Myth and the Reality, but I think it's the same album. Uh, I'll put that in the comments section. Make sure we'll put a link out there. Yeah. Myth and reality. That's good. Yeah. And it's available on, on Spotify and probably on, on you know, iTunes and things. So it's, I mean, it's out there. You can stream it and everything. Uh, he tells a lot of great stories about the doors. One of them is that he tells is that at one, at a concert, when they were becoming famous, the guy announced them as Jim Morrison and the doors. And Jim Morrison told the guys, no, we're not going out. We're not going out. And the guy finally came back and said, why aren't you going out? I said, you haven't introduced us. You know, you introduce us right and we'll come out. I said, well, what do you mean? I just introduced you. No, no, no. You said Jim Morrison and the doors. We're the doors. And, you know, you look at their songwriting credit, uh, it's the doors. Typically, I mean, some of them are individually credited. Robbie Krieger wrote quite a few of their hits, actually. But most of their songs are written by the doors because they all contributed. So I don't think, I don't think Ray would say, oh, yeah, no, that bothered me. But you wonder if it would, you know? I mean, I don't know. And I I mean, part of that would be is maybe that's why they were such good teammates Mm -hmm. is that they had this 
had a team concept. And so when they played together, I mean, if somebody is willing to do that and you're like, okay, yeah, we are actually a team. And so now everybody, because it, when you watch how well they support Jim Morrison playing, mm-hmm. like his keyboards, and I think he talks a little bit, I was reading that a little bit of the Light, Light My Fire, mm-hmm. is a, oh, the book, the book yeah. he wrote, talks a little bit about this idea of, you know, when you listen to how you listen to jazz or how you listen to some of the blues artists and sort of the give and take, like how do you let someone take lead? Mm-hmm. Well, maybe you know, maybe you play a rhythm that they can play over, or maybe you just right. hold back, you know, a, a little bit on the sound, and, and, and then that gives them the opportunity to lead on the song. So you got to be a tight team to be able to pull that off. And so if you're, if you have, you know, is that harder on a, if you have a prima donna on your, mm-hmm. on your team, and you're, you're saying is like, did it, did it bother? So especially in 1967, I mean, they're playing at each other for a little bit, but was that part of the reason maybe that that Jim does that? I mean, I, that's a good question. Yeah, and I think, I mean, maybe part of the reason that Jim, you know, made that stand at the, you know, when he was announced that way was to make it clear because I, I'm, he probably thought, well, this is, this might bother them because I am getting all the attention, you know? So yeah, or I, maybe I, I they had to make a, it clear. But, uh, a, a big band blowout. Or maybe they told him, you know, hey, you know, idiot, you're getting all the attention, <laughs> right? Yeah, well, exactly. Mm-hmm. And then later on, the media was like, oh no, we're all we're all friends mm-hmm. here. But maybe it was like, yeah, maybe, maybe maybe there were moments where maybe they weren't friends for a moment, and they just had to have yeah, some yeah. heart to heart. And that was like, no, we need to be the doors if we're gonna if we're gonna be tight and, mm-hmm. and play like this. Yeah. I, I think it's a good question. I think. Um, mm-hmm. And again, I, I think Ray would say, no, it never bothered me at all. I got to play my music. I got to play with friends, you know, an old friend. And then he became great friends with the other two guys, too. You know, what, what I made a career out of this. What, what, what could possibly bother me about that? I'm pretty, I think that's what he would say, but I'd like to ask him. He's still pretty – I mean, I guess he's not that – how old is he then? He's, he was older than – Because he went to grad school. He, he was, did his army he was tour. He was pushing 30. Yeah, point. he was a little. He was probably like late tw- twenty eight or so, give or take 28, 29, 29. When he started. So he's probably a little more mature and able to mm-hmm. handle that. Handle that. But that's a good question. Like part, still part of the reason he was the grown up is he was he was about five years older than the other the other guys. That was that was one of the reasons. So. Yeah, it, it, well, that kind of leads me into a question about his army. So mm-hmm. he, he does this. So the there's kind of the mythology that he. That says he's in New York, he's drunk. He walks into the recruiter's office. Um, he says the army recruiter says, "If you want to shoot film, we got a great opportunity for you. You can do, you can be part of Army um, Signals Command. They they produce films. This would be a good opportunity for you. Um, a way for you to make some money, maybe." And so he signs up. Mm-hmm. Now I, I kind of like like I don't know how much because he's he's out of college. And he's done some grad, he's done law school for a year, mm-hmm. and he's done like some film school at this point. Yeah, he started and then left. Yeah. And so, like, would you be drunk enough to all of a sudden sign up for the army and not be able to get yourself out of it? Like, I, you know, all I can say, the story goes, I guess they were in uh, New York City and got so drunk he went down to lower Manhattan where he was recruiting and signed up. I, if that's true, I only wish I'd been there to that party because it sounds like a wild one. But, uh, you know, yeah, I, you have to wonder if that really happened or if that's – he's kind of remembering putting a couple of things together or, you know, he got drunk. He was thinking about it anyway, and then he happened to get drunk, you know, whatever. whatever. I mean, you know, it's – you wonder. Because it makes the myth- – I mean, the mythology of the doors, it certainly runs it, – it does a great job running the mythology of the doors. Mm-hmm. It just – it's just – for me, it's hard to believe that that this army recruiter is going to get you <laughs> to j- join up and um, uh, this grad student is going to be able to get, get them to join up. Well, and keep in mind, too, this is the – this would have been like the early 60s or – Early to mid '60s, probably a '60, 
what was it, maybe 62 or three, something like that. So, you know, Vietnam is, is has started, but it isn't really hot yet. There is a military draft still, uh, but there's not a huge need for people. I got to think of a recruiter. Now, I've never been a recruiter, but I got to think of a recruiter sees a, a stumble drunk guy walk in when they don't really need a bunch of people. I mean, they didn't have the big need that they had a few years later, and they did have a draft going on at that point. He might say, get out of here. You know, <laughs> Come back in a week if you still want to do this. But, you know, get out of here. I'm not going to sign up a guy that doesn't even know what he's doing. I mean, I don't know. Would that would that be fair? Yeah, well, today <laughs> definitely would have, because you don't, nothing like, nothing um, counts until you actually show up. So it's like, mm-hmm. even if you have your contract, it's, if you don't show up, then you you can get out. It's not mm-hmm. like, like, yeah. Like, uh, um, so it, it seems to me like we're part of Ray wanted to do this and, and check it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that'd be my question. Probably already, like, well, probably had already decided, but he did, maybe he had a few drinks before he went in. <laughs> that could be, but I think he had already decided. I don't think he signed up cause he was drunk. I think he signed up and was drunk. Maybe. It, it was it was drunk. And how much was it really? So how much, hard is it to get away from that mythology because the doors has this mythology of being counterculture having if you do something that is culture and that do you like do the pa folks or the public affairs folks come after you it's like no we need to rewrite that a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah we didn't we weren't seeking you out you were drunk and <laughs> right, and so so, so the Zeke start getting rewritten, and then over time that story just keeps getting retold and retold. Mm-hmm. It just part of it doesn't just, you know, why not just say, you know, I, I decided to join the army for a year, it didn't work out, and come out. But yeah, yeah so so I mean, I appreciate the mythology, but the yeah, it's a great story, but I may or you know, it might be a little exaggerated, perhaps. Yeah, so would, I don't know if you would ever get the real story out, but it, I think that would be a question would, I would have. That would be fascinating. And then if it really literally is true, then why didn't you invite me? I mean, maybe I was only about five years old at the time, but still, you could have. it was the thought that came. Invite you to the Army? No, into, to that party where he got so drunk. That he was oh, like, he was in New York. You <laughs> was like five years. I was, yeah. I you were, were in Chicago, so you're uh, too far away. Uh, I, I, for a party that good, I would have gone. It would be weird. I mean, you'd be a five-year-old <laughs> at this, like, tw- well, how old was he, 25? He would have been about 25. Yeah, or so like you're a five-year-old so, yeah, at 20. That would have been very awkward. Yeah. Yeah, you know, probably wouldn't have worked out, but... Anyway, you know, actually, you mentioned Chicago, and that reminds me, that kind of leads me to another question here. Um, Ray grew up in Chicago, um, south side, but nobody's perfect. Uh, I'm a north sider myself, but... So wh- yeah. what's the deal between north side and south side Chicago? So like, yeah. I, and here in Omaha, there's like Council Tucky, yeah. we call oh, it Council yeah. Tucky in Omaha. And I'm not originally mm-hmm. from Omaha, so I, I find it amusing, but I... Like well, let me, let me say neither South nor North Side are as bad as Council Bluffs. Okay, so but Council so Bluffs just looks that, like okay. Omaha. Like, <laughs> well, I, like, yeah. like the the rivalry make, is amusing to me, but it's like the, the it doesn't. It does. and there's a big there's a big South Side North Side. Uh, I think part of it is you know Sox versus Cubs. Part of it is um, to some extent different ethnics. Maybe uh, South now, are you side. giving away like state secrets? Where now like we're gonna have to. Hmm. Well, no, I think I think most people that are familiar with the South Side North Side so, split would 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 know they know about it already. Um, a lot of it is Sox or Cubs, um, and some it's so some you Sox or Cubs? Oh, I'm well, I'm Cubs. I'm, you know, <laughs> I was a North Sider, so you know. Uh, but he, you know, Ray was Ray was a legit South Sider. I grew up in at like 35th and Western, which. You know, a very working class neighbor still is always. Was, so you know, like always will so be. That's awesome because you know, like when, when you read his address, you're like, oh, that's mm-hmm. what. That's pretty cool. Yeah, McKinley Park. Even uh, of course, he talks about it on the spoken word thing too. But he says, yeah, it was, he said and he defines it as basically 35th and Western. Oh, yeah, okay. So he's probably a Sox fan, but again, nobody's perfect because <laughs> that's not real far from Sox Park. So he probably was a Sox fan. But uh, growing up there, he went to. Um, you know, his parents were working class. Uh, they were not Polish immigrants, but their parents were Polish immigrants. Went to uh, St. Rita's High School. For those of you familiar with the Chicago area, St. Rita's, a Catholic high school, had 2,000 boys. So they had outstanding, football, uh, outstanding sports teams, and they, they still do, for as far as I know. But 
uh, he was actually on the basketball team there and wanted to play, said, I want to play um, power forward or center. And the coach said, no, you're going to play guard. He said, no, I'm not going to play guard. He said, well, you're going to play guard or, or you're off the team. He said, all right, I quit. You know, so, <laughs> it, you know, that, that story, that, that kind of points out, I think, some of his, uh, his well, two things, points out his uh, you know, rebelliousness, but it also, also points out, you know, he had, he had kind of an artistic vision. And if you can call wanting to play power forward an artistic vision, okay, and maybe a stretch, but, you know, he kind of knew what he wanted. What, he, what result he wanted, and if he wasn't going to get that result, he wouldn't do it. And I thought early on we see that, and so I, yeah, I guess my my question would be: Is that where else did did we see that? And I mean, what things did you not do in in your musical career because of that? You know, using that same strategy, using that same criteria that hey, this is the vision, I'm going to do this, or I'm, I'm not going to do it. So it's almost like a stubborn. Um, child and so like mm-hmm. the thing it, or it's like, like it reminds me of something like a two-year-old would do be mm-hmm. like all right you're not gonna i won't allow you to do this mm-hmm. oh you won't let me have the cheetos for dinner mm-hmm. well then i'm not eating dinner yeah yeah then I, i'm not like i'm eat. throwing the whole thing out mm-hmm. so it's like an all or nothing type of um strategy well and see maybe i can relate to that because my when i was when i was a kid you know another another story here up on the north side, you know, when I, when I was a kid, my uh, my mom made something that I didn't like for dinner. And I said, I'm not going to eat it. And she said, well, you're going to eat it or you're not going to have dinner. I said, all right, fine, I won't have dinner. And she said, you know what, if you don't eat it tonight, you're going to get it in the morning for breakfast. I said, yeah, well, I won't eat it then either. And got up the next morning, same thing, sitting there and didn't eat it. She said, you're going to eat it. And I said, no, I'm not. And she said, well, then guess what? You're going to get it when you come home for lunch. Yep, I came oh, home wow. for lunch, sitting there. Said, nope, not gonna eat it. So finally, you see, it, it, it worked. Finally, she said, you know, I mean, this kid's gotta eat. I mean, they're gonna call DCFS on me or some point here. This kid's so this gotta is like eat after at school. Point. This was, well, it was like lunch the next day, I think. Okay. Uh, where she finally said, all right, you know. And, you know, so I, maybe I can relate to that in Ray. Maybe we're, we're, we're kind of kids. Is this like something from Chicago? Sense. So I guess, I guess it could this, be, I, you know. It's, like, I guess I, I can picture somebody from Chicago just being very obstinate like that, I guess. Is that, that the... There's, there is a lot of that going on, yeah. I mean, that's... <laughs> is that the Polish kind of like heritage, you think? The, or the, could be, I mean, because, you know, you, you look at Chicago, I mean, some of the bigger ethnics there are Polish, they're generally East European in general. Or Eastern European, um, yeah. There's also there's strong German there. Uh, more came over before those guys, uh, before the Poles. Um, there's a decent amount of Italian. It, it's it's <laughs> it's right a lot of Irish, obviously too. It's really uh, as I mentioned all these ethnic groups. I stubbornness could be associated with with all with of it, them, yes. with any or all of them. So maybe it's just so like yeah, maybe it, maybe it is. Maybe, maybe it's just it is an immigrant immigrant trend where mm-hmm. you you got to have some sort of stubbornness of hey like it's not working out here mm-hmm. i'm getting out of this right. place and i'm yeah. going to a new country with mm-hmm. a new new nationality and you got to have this stubbornness to be able to pull that off and maybe that just yeah. and you know it's not going to be easy but you know what hey I, i'm going to do this and if i don't eat for three days okay well you know i'm, I'm no i'm not going to do that so if, if that's what it takes okay and so you're, oh, you, you oh, as a kid, like you watch your parents do this and you mm-hmm. end up copying them yeah. and, that, and then it pays off where your mom can't feed you anymore. Right. Yeah. She's well, like, it's... look, I just want you to eat food and you just get like more and more stubborn because <laughs> like you watched her pull the same trick <laughs> off. Right. That's, that's pretty funny. I think we're on question. So the question there. So what was your, that was. Well, t- see, that's, that's one of them where it might be hard to find the question, but I think, I think really with that, I guess well, I, I, I would ask Ray, like. Tell me about some times in your musical career where you did something like that, because I, I really see that as as a character thing with him. I, I think he I, I think he did that a bunch probably in his life. Yeah, and, and almost like where up where, where in the music like what musical thing would you maybe would somebody else have done uh, like a an album that would, people would laugh at today maybe uh, or you know you're gonna open for the Captain and Tennille and you said I'm not gonna do that yeah where what what, what things didn't you do that. Where that came in, yeah, it came into play. That 
stuff in this game. Yeah, there's probably a couple different ways to, to go down that hole, but it's I'll be interested on where it came from. Like, if, mm-hmm. if as you're a kid, like where did you pick that trade up of mm-hmm. um, you get something stuck in your head and then you just don't let go of it? Like mm-hmm. where, like was your dad like that? Was your mom mm-hmm. like that? Like how did you get? How did you get that trait? Well, and, then, and you know, that's with mine. It's just you don't like the food, all right? But, I mean, his is so specific. It's like, okay, I will play. I'll be on this team, and I'll play power forward. But I'm not going to be on exactly the same team and play three feet away from the power forward. No, I'm not going to do that. Right, and I mean, so, like, that's, that's he, really specific. <laughs> but, you know, like, kids get these ideas in their head about, like, certain, like, maybe he was told, like, guard, you know, the only one important on the team, like he'd listen to his dad. The only one important on the team is nobody cares about the guard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so then yeah. like now he's going forward with that idea. That, like he got this idea in his head mm-hmm. that the guard's not important and, and uh, no one's going to um, pay attention to him. He also seemed kind of obsessed. I mean, I guess every guy's obsessed with, um, that's not true. Really. I mean, he, he's very obsessed with um, meeting girls. And so maybe no, I, this I think idea. it'd be fair to say every guy. Is <laughs> well, not every guy. That's a fair. Well, not every guy, but but, it, but it's like large the, majority. I would say. Of, are yeah, there's pretty a lot of guys obsessed with that. I would there's say a lot of guys yeah, that yeah. obsessed with me. But like he's definitely um, obsessed with that. Maybe yeah, mm-hmm. this like notion of oh, like, this, if, um, girls like the power forward. Better. Girls like the power forward better than the guard, mm-hmm. and maybe that that was like they could see him. I don't know. It, it, like I'm just reaching for. I, I'm I'm just guessing though that if I went home and asked my wife, "Could you, what's the difference between a power forward and a guard?" She'd say, "What are we talking about?" Um, I don't know that to a lot of the girls that that matters much. I think well, it was like well, it, how how you looked, and you know, it, it was more, less like, "Oh, I play power forward." Yeah, I, I don't know that that mattered. Well, <laughs> right. I'm not saying it's irrational. You know? like, 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 but that's what I'm saying is like yeah. he had this like. Like an irrational, because it seems completely irrational. Like, mm-hmm. why would you not be the, like you said, you, why wouldn't you just be some other? There's not yeah. that many positions on the basketball no, team. There are five. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. There, <laughs> there are five. There's five. <laughs> five total. And a couple of them repeat. There are two guards. So there are really only four, if you think about it. There you go. Is it? I mean, you know, so it's, yeah, it's a, it's a short list. It's, 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 so if you make the team, like, like, uh, you, you might be on bench for a little bit, but when you go into play, I mean, you, mm-hmm. you're you going to get a lot of attention. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and really, and again, I, you know, not to make too much of it, but, you know, a lot of the high schools, the, the Catholic high schools back then had outstanding teams. I mean, because, you know, you think about it, 2,000, they had 2,000 boys, maybe 500 would go out for the team, and they'd hire, you know, 11. <laughs> so they really could get, like the best athletes in the area, they really had some great teams, and so you'd be on. I mean, I gotta think. I don't know, but I gotta think that the St. Rita team when he was on it was, was you know, city champ, close to city champ. I mean, pretty in the finals, certainly, well, like big team, major major team. Yeah. You know? So I don't know. But and also like a basketball team. If you're on the basketball team, on a football team, you might have 80 players and mm-hmm. they rotate. And if you're not the quarterback. Um, and you're not the key, one of the key receivers. I mean, you're you're part of the team, mm-hmm. and unless somebody knows your number, they're not going to know. Well, yeah, yeah. In football, it might make more sense. Like you can be our you can be our offensive tackle, and nobody's ever going to know your name. Okay, or you could be the uh, receiver, the wide receiver. Well, no, okay, I want to be the wide receiver because that's cool. Everybody's going to know my name. Yeah. In basketball, yeah, it seems very odd. Five guys, sport. everybody's gonna know your name. Right? Yeah, it's, you it's know, a, they're gonna know your name. I mean, yeah, it's like, that many. I'm gonna do s- swimming, and I'm only gonna do the breaststroke. On, right, I will yeah. not. I yeah. refuse to do freestyle. Yeah, so yeah, it's mm-hmm. very, very oddly specific. Mm-hmm. Right? It's a good question. Like where, my, my, mm-hmm. I think my question on that what you brought up would be is like, mm-hmm. where did you get that trait? <laughs> and it, yeah. I think your question mm-hmm. is like, where else does he see it? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's pretty. Yeah, I think yeah. that's interesting. Mm-hmm. I think we're on question. Let's see, that was question two. So, all right. So we're. No, I think this is before because then we. I think that's we right. Did. So you're. I'll well, put, yeah. So you're up with question four. We are zipping along. Eight to ten. Up. Question four. Well, I think. Okay. I think we are on question four, but the, the we had two versions of the same question. Mm-hmm. So my piggybacking off that question is this. 
He's ops. I'm going to go back to Laos for a second. And I just have so many questions about Laos. Laos the country, not – he's not calling Ray a Laos. Okay, just – I don't think anybody thinks I'm calling him Laos. No, okay. like, Laos. We like we like Ray. I mean, yeah. we're yeah. We're, I think it's pronounced Laos. It's not late like Laos. No, it's, no, it's Laos. But Laos. It's, it, in English, it's the same as you know a Laos, right? <laughs> so just to be clear, isn't Laos also like a bug? Yeah, yeah. It's like it, it's like it's a individual lice, or plural would be lice. So I have lice, but this is not one indivi- individual Laos. One individual Laos. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be like. If you have mice, you have meeses. You have meese. I have a meese. You have a meese? Yeah. And I have one meese. And so you have lice, you have Elise? Elise. Or Elise's? I assume or my, sister's, my sister's case. name is Elise, but I, and she's not. I would not. So say, you associate your sister she's a with the no, lice? I am not. No. How did that pop in your head? <laughs> no, I, well, because Elise. Like, Elise, wow, okay. My sister's name. I don't know. She may be watching. If she is, we're not talking about you, okay? We're de- <laughs> what we're talking about we're is not that. talking about yeah. Elise. No. So we will not bring up no. that. We will not bring up Elise no. again. So as we're talking about <laughs> Laos, that's but not Laos, Elise. Right? <laughs> um, Which is not the plural of lice, but okay. And so in early 19... So yeah, my question before we talked about Elise mm-hmm. was... <laughs> it's a Southeast Asian country is what we're talking about. Yes. It's right next to Vietnam. We're not talking about your sister. That's... May have read it's not near it. Vietnam. What? No, it, it's right next to Vietnam. <laughs> Your sister's near Vietnam? No, my sister is nowhere near Vietnam. She's well, good. Unless well, I guess it's Massachusetts. I mean, she's a little closer to Vietnam. Well, I guess I'm a little closer to Vietnam than she is. But anyway. There's nice beaches there, so yeah. she might be. Oh, yeah. She might enjoy vacationing. Yeah. yeah. No, they got surfing and, you know. Most of the landmines are gone. It's, you know, it's pretty cool. Landmines. <laughs> so back to Laos. Back to so Laos. He, there's a story of him... And it was, I think it was, um, there's this little article uh, of a guy that was in the army with him. And he talks about how he met uh, Ray Manzarek on on Okinawa. He goes through, uh, so Ray enlisted and he's in Okinawa now. And he's in um, Army Security Agency, which was the Army's component, if you will, like, there's the National Security Agency, and then the Army had this before Army stood up uh, INSCOM, and so they had the Army Security Agency, and uh, he was working there. The story it's like, it's is like military intelligence. I mean, this yeah, is, he was military it's, intelligence. It's like, and so he the story is is he won't sign a security he, 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 as they're in briefing him on what he's supposed to be doing. He won't sign the document, mm-hmm. and so they put him in special flight, and, and because he won't sign the document. And he doesn't want to sign the document because he thinks if he signs it, he'll never be allowed to travel to Poland. And so, first of all... Apparently he wanted to go to Poland. Now, he had never gone to Poland or... Beforehand. But apparently he wanted to go to Poland. But Poland's under USSR. I mean, this is... USSR. Yeah. And so, part Mm -hmm. of this, like, it it doesn't make sense to me because it's like, who... This would be like going to North Korea today. Mm -hmm. Um... Like who you're you're in the army, you're already in an intelligence command. When would it be a good idea to go to Poland and USSR time Russia versus well, like, well, like to be like today, like even if you didn't sign the document, mm-hmm. but you hey, let's go take a tour of North Korea. Like North Korea is gonna know you've been in army intelligence. Uh they're mm-hmm. w- what's gonna happen as soon as you get off the bus there, you're gonna get interrogated. Right. So the the, the story kind of breaks down, starts breaking down there. And then it really starts breaking down. So the army sends him to Laos. Mm-hmm. Well, 1960s, this is, Laos is in the middle of a civil war. The U.S. is trying to keep, the, the Soviets are, fun, are on one side of it. Um, we're working on the other side. The U.S. is working on the other side. And so we send him from Okinawa to what was... I mean, there were multiple CIA operations. These all been declassified, and so if you you know pull these up, and there's multiple CIA operations going on in Laos, and we, they send Ray Manzarek into Laos to go do these things. Mm-hmm. And the write up on it is is the army's trying to pressure him to sign the document. He's rock and roll. He never signs it. 
Um, and, and so he's, but he's in Laos and he comes out of Laos with a whole new appreciation for marijuana because he, he learns all, he oh, finds yeah. all well, he these different, really good stuff. Right? He finds like, he brought he's, a lot home, a I mean, lot he home it for years, basically. I mean, he brought a lot. Home. That's, it, well, that's the story. Time. Sorry. Yeah. But that's the, like, that's the story that's been, that's told. It's so my question that says, I don't know that I buy like, like personality wise. Okay. He doesn't mm-hmm. sign the document and that fits in with the. The story it's the stubborn, but it fits in with the stubborn. But. Um, it just doesn't, it just doesn't mesh with me that he, he the army sends him to Laos and he's just like it is so hard to get. It's a remote location. Mm-hmm. It would be all the paperwork they would have to do, not just the paperwork, but you're just putting bringing somebody in that's going to cause so much trouble that you have to babysit. Why would they do that? And then send him. How like the story just doesn't make sense. So my question went to him was was he actually working for CIA? Did CIA recruit him when he got out of film school and he was doing like a one year tour? Um, and like like he drops out of film school, goes joins the army, and this is sort of like his socialization. And then he comes back and he's actually working for CIA now as because mm-hmm. he got the counterculture movement or maybe as an FBI asset um, coming in. It's my conspiracy theory on on Ray Manzarek. And so, not based mainly on the fact that they sent him into Laos, um, and it, it just seemed very odd to me that that, that would have happened. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's a decent question because whatever, um, yeah, what, whatever you may think of, you know, the military. I mean, think about this. Here's somebody that wouldn't sign a security clearance, and so they're going to take him from Okinawa, which is sort of a one of the many kind of installations of intelligence where everybody could watch him well, <laughs> and they're going to send him hub, so. and they're going to send him to a place not very far from Vietnam where uh, there's a civil war going on where nobody can watch him. <laughs> yeah, and it's I, unacknowledged. Are they so, really going to do that? We have these I unacknowledged don't, operations don't, going on in there. Yeah. So, so it, a decent question. Um, I, so that's my question. It's just sort of a conspiracy theory it was related to the stubborn mm-hmm. question. Um, it, and so, and, yeah, could be. I mean, you know, I've heard of Stranger Things. Maybe they sent him there. But on the other hand, maybe, you know, maybe he was kind of involved with some of the intelligence even afterwards. And because uh, the CIA was very interested in LSD, you know, the LSD movements yep. and, and rock and roll in general. I mean, we've seen a lot of reports to that to that effect. They they were watching John Lennon among others. They're watching. Uh, Quite a few. So instead of being so. counterculture, he is the man. He is the culture. Ooh, you know. Yeah. I mean, and and you know, you look at it's kind of interesting. When you think about the Doors. We think about you think about that era. You think they're very anti-war. Yet here you've got Ray military intelligence. Uh, you got uh, Jim Morrison, Admiral Son, son of like the Sync Pack commander. Uh, Not Sync Pack command. He wasn't Sync Pack commander, but he was a. Well, he was. He was an admiral. Admiral. You know, yeah. On the Pacific, so you know it's uh, you wonder, uh, you wonder how much of that. And and another thing too, which kind of leads into one of the other discussion points. Uh, they uh, well, well, we'll come back to a related question on that. But he, they they reached success very a very circuitous route and fairly quickly. So this is your comparison. I, I, so I think we got question four. I think we should. Have, Delve into we'll question, question five. five. Okay, question five is is uh, you know something that we'll come back to the possible intelligence connection, but uh, question five. We're gonna be the conspiracy channel. The conspiracy. Yeah, I mean, I you know, you know we have and let me just, we have no evidence of any of this, but but he was in Laos. Question. He was in Laos, but that we do know. Yeah, and his si- and and Stephen's sister Elise is she's, not in she's Laos. She's not in she's not in Laos. She's not in Vietnam. She's in uh, I think Massachusetts, as far as I know. But okay. Uh, they uh, Ray's brother, uh, actually two of his brothers, were in a group called uh, Rick and the Ravens. Uh, and Ray, they needed somebody to come in. They wanted the keyboards guy. They had they had Ray come in, but he couldn't use his last name. They called him, you know, Raging Ray something, Ray Johnson or something. <laughs> he created a different name for him. But uh, he played with them, and they were they would do. It's kind of a funny aside. They played at a place called the uh, Turkey Joint West, and Ray, Ray, great wife. Uh, they were married. They were together for like fifty years. Dorothy, uh, Dorothy, yeah. <laughs> Dorothy said, 
you know, decent. It, it, apparently, it was like a dive. It was all. It was like wet. It was right near the ocean in uh, Santa Monica, I think. And it was a dive. There was a turkey joint west, and she said, "Gosh, do you suppose there's a turkey joint east somewhere?" <laughs> it was just kind of funny. And I doubt that there is, but um, they would play there. They were like a surf rock group. For whatever reason, now, okay, this is probably mid-60s, about 64 or 5 in uh, Southern California. Beach Boys are obviously big. Jan and Dean, you know, the Benchers. There were a lot of surf rock groups. And these guys were not at that level. So why is, like, Rick and the Ravens? Yeah, Rick and the Ravens, they were not at the, anywhere near the level of the Beach Boys or anything like that as far as popularity or, or anything like that. But they suddenly are under contract with Columbia Records. Rick and the Ravens. Now, they never actually made a record, so what which you're is saying, even more interesting. Right. So you're saying, what you're implying here is that perhaps there was like government intervention to, to, to uh, this was well, like... you know, you wonder, because I got to think in 1965 in Southern California, there must have been 200 surf rock groups. And... Were these guys, you know, that good? <laughs> that Columbia Records signed them, but never recorded them. By the way, so that's maybe that's even more interesting. Yeah, they were good enough to sign, but not good enough to record. Well, and then the even, even more interesting from that, um, then once that contract, that group basically kind of fell apart. Some of the other people quit, and everything. so well, let's see. But Columbia kept Ray. Yeah, he said, "Why well, I got another? I can get another group." Yeah, he put the you know, he had just run back into Jim Morrison after you know, all these years and, and put the put the doors together. He said, "So they were originally under contract with Columbia too." So a group that didn't even exist kept that contract. I mean, they really wanted him for some reason. Now he outstanding talent, yes, but was there more? I guess I don't know. I guess I, I think it's an interesting question. So. How well it either speaks to that the business acumen or the mm-hmm. like that that Ray Mandrak had this was good at business in the arts industry mm-hmm. or um, was there some help like how how did he get good like what like you're mm-hmm. like how do you go from being an average band to have, being good we were yeah. talking about ACDC and uh, Angus and Malcolm and they had like sort of their secret weapon was their brother George who was in the band Easy Beats and kind of yeah. could help mm-hmm. um, mentor them and gave them some access to places that uh, yeah. that they normally wouldn't have. Mm-hmm. Who was the Doors Easy, who was the Doors George and the implication there, you know, was it, was, was it because there's these government connections there that, that opened doors in Hollywood at some, or in the music industry in some mm-hmm. way? That's interesting. I don't know. Well, and just, I, I mean, I've known a lot of bands that tried to get uh, contracts, recording contracts, and, uh, you know, it's not it's not easy. And the fact that he just, that they had one, and he just kind of walked a band that didn't exist into the same contract. You know, Columbia Records, too. This wasn't like, you know, Joe's Records. It seems Eddie's so. Records. When you <laughs> read, Columbia Records was like yeah, when you giant read, of the era. You know, it still is. I mean, I don't know. Well, yeah, when you read these the uh, biographies and the when they talk about this they make it sound like oh yeah and we got this record like we were playing and then we got a record contract uh, and it's like, it's like not, wow yeah like, no, there's, there's more to it it seems like <laughs> it seems uh, like you know, yeah. it was so easy in the 1960s to get it but there's all these bands that must have been trying that don't mm-hmm. get a record contract so yeah that's yeah kind of interesting and they and they never now the one good thing that came out of that Columbia connection was uh, they never made a record, and they weren't, apparently, they were really getting a big clue that they were never going to make a record in Columbia with, with the Doors. But, you know, the guy said, hey, you know, we're, we'll, I'll call you eventually. Look, in the meantime, do you need anything? And they asked for money. He said, well, I can't give you any money. But, hey, tell you what, Columbia Records just bought Vox, which oh, wow. is a, an instrument manufacturer, primarily keyboards and various other things like electronic uh, instruments. He said, you know what? They got this big warehouse out in the valley. You guys go out there within reason. You know, don't take, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. But, uh, you know, just take whatever you want. You know, within reason. Yeah, take whatever equipment you want. So, so that's where he got all his great, the, the great Vox keyboard that he played was as a result of that. Well, so you're, yeah. So your question went from, so the, 
was kind of like I asked that question about him being that in what was going on with Laos? Mm -hmm. What's the real deal there? Your question here is um, Rick and the Ravens Mm -hmm. got a record deal to sign. Mm -hmm. What's the deal there? Yeah. Okay. So that's, I think that's a good question. And then what you led on to there is this thing with Vox. This, my question, I got a follow on question Mm -hmm. that, that this brings in on Vox, which I think takes us Mm -hmm. to six. Well, I actually, I got, I got a tag along question with the, the Rick and the, and the Ravens thing. They were a surf rock group, and you can hear, you can hear a little bit of surf rock in the Doors. Uh, sometimes the way they use the guitars, they use it mostly as a, a slide, and almost as a replacement for a sitar, which was a big psychedelic instrument of the era. You know, now basically appears only in Indian restaurants, but back then it used to be all over rock records. Uh, you know, but surf guitar uses a, a, a slide, a twang like that. And they're usually using the uh, the treble and bar to do it, but you know what? I guess I'd like to talk to him about any surf rock influences in the Doors and kind of see where you know, like see if he if he sees any connections between because there were a lot of variety of influences that went into their music. Uh, what role does surf rock play? I think that's a very different question. So that might it be is, yeah, that, that might was, be and that, so, was, that was sort of a question, but I, I wanted to slide it with the CIA one there. What is it? You know, but that was, that was really from, my question. You went from conspiracy to does surf rock? You have a surf it, rock. Okay. It, it, well, you have yeah. a surf rock tune. It goes. That was a hard transition. <laughs> yeah. To make. Well, it's, yeah. Okay. And elite. Did those, does your sister listen to surf rock? I. You know, I, she probably does. All right. I, let's. I'll have to ask her. I don't know. I don't know. So, <laughs> you know, if you're at least if you're if you're watching, uh, type in yes or no. Uh, do you listen to surf rock or no? I hate surf rock. Whatever. Whichever I, I actually like surf rock. I'm a, I'm sort of a surf rock fan. So, so that's surf rock. so hence that, that hence that question because I, I kind of like surf rock. rock. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. Well, my question went back to Vox. You mentioned Vox, mm-hmm. yeah. and so in 19, I, I got, um, I went down this rabbit hole. I went and looked up. No, like, really. <laughs> I went and I was looking at. Okay, so why? Where did this iconic sound come from? Where, mm-hmm. like specifically on the keyboard, he's playing keyboard and he's playing keyboard bass. And so I went down this rabbit hole of, okay, so when, why, why is he playing keyboard bass? And where, where did this come from? And so he, I mean, you can trade, some of it was, he talks about his childhood. He got really good playing and left. He, he's watching musicians. He's watching um, rhythm and blues artists. And he, he, uh, he talks about the boogie woogie and how you know the rhythm is like sex and like it, he can never get tired of the rhythm because he never gets tired of sex was kind of the the, the implication there and and so he gets good at ha- having his left hand do one thing while his right hand does something else mm-hmm. so that kind of talks to him being you know having this ambidextrous capability or just being mm-hmm. being able to pull this off on an organ as he's playing. But really, Vox, the sound that you hear and kind of associated maybe with the, the psychedelic, the, the, the distortion, the time distortion that they're working with, um, the, the Vox keyboard bass is introduced in 1960. So that's the first time this comes out. And it's interesting that that's how they get a hold of it is through this Columbia mm-hmm. deal. They yeah. get a hold of this brand new keyboard bass. It's only been in 1960. And the reason it's not been in 1960 is because the transistor isn't mass. You can't pro- transistors aren't mass producible until 1959. And in 1959, you had two immigrants. You had a Korean guy, and I think the other guy was from um, India, if I recall right. You had these two. They work. They're working for Bell Labs, and they produce. They, they're able to come up with the engineering to mass produce the transistor. Mm-hmm. With the mass produced transistor, you then get the box keyboard where they replace a lot of the moving um, spinning wheels and you get the keyboard bass. Well, when I see if, if the transistor had listened to more boogie woogie, it would have been mass produced long before 1959, right? That is oh. a great dad joke. I think, I think, I think you get a 10. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You get full <laughs> points. You get full points. That is probably the, that is the best dad joke of today. 
The transistor it wasn't mass produced. Was it mass produced? Not enough boogie woogie. Not enough there you go. Boogie-woogie. Okay, right. I understand. I write that one down <laughs> for dad jokes. Later. Dad jokes. Yeah. That's, well, you know, like, you know, so, sometimes that's all you got, right? <laughs> but, anyway, <laughs> but I digress. Go ahead. Go ahead. So what is my, so? So this got me pondering. Not it got me pondering that was the technology development more of the so there was this there's this in, in pop culture is the idea that they're the you're trying to recreate the the experience of acid so you're doing the um, time distortion they're doing um, uh, trying to be somewhere outside yourself I mean I also guess the trans I mean you can talk about meditation where you're trying to you know, lose yourself mm-hmm. which which is a good story, but the technology is the keyboard and the keyboard bass, and it fundamentally comes down to the transistor, which comes up with this new sound. And so you have this new technology that comes out that's close to the organ, but different and different enough that let's go play with it. And you see that today, I think, with auto tune, like you mm-hmm. see this huge boom in music oh, yeah. and auto tune, which I think will die out because you'll. Like people will go, oh yeah, I've heard auto tune before. Yeah, now. Well, kind of sounds insane, yeah, so. right. And so, so yeah, yeah. So in this time frame, you have this new technology that comes out, and so let's play with the technology and mm-hmm. see what kind of sounds we can come up with. Mm-hmm. Now I'm not like so I'm not saying that that the the, the Tim Leary and and, and um, wasn't part of that kind of mis- mystique on it. I think that story mythology is important, mm-hmm. but really. I think my question is, is how much of what he was doing was technology driven mm-hmm. versus following the, the pop culture mythology of how this, how this happened. I would just be, that was yeah. kind of my question. Cause if you, when we were mm-hmm. talking, I remember talking about Jimi Hendrix and he, he tries the wah-wah pedals and tries um, all these new things on the guitar largely because there's new technology that came out which mm-hmm. was the transistor and so there's, there's like boom and music uh innovation going on in terms of the electronic yeah. uh in, in terms of what kind of sounds you can get so you experiment and so you get this experimenting culture obviously other lots of other things are happening politically and whatnot mm-hmm. but how much of that is not being driven just by this technology coming out so it is yeah. is you know, so really, my question there is how much the technology drive that sound, mm-hmm. um, it, or how much would he think that that technology drove drove the sound? That's you know, that's a good question because I, I mean, I would have to say um, that it was both really, but I think it's I think without the technology, it wouldn't have happened. So I mean, it's you know, on the one hand, there has to be the desire to do that, but on the other hand, if you, if there's not a way to do it, then it's not going to happen. On the other, but on the other hand, if there's a way to do something but nobody cares, nothing's going to happen. But if there's a way to do it and suddenly people care, yeah. I'm mean, thinking of LSD. LSD was actually discovered, you know, decades before the '60s. Right. But there wasn't the great desire to to do expanded consciousness. Well, when there was, oh boy, <laughs> there it was. The technology was there. So I think with with the with the with the box, it's it's much the same way. I mean, I think there. Uh, it, it's a little closer in time because I think that technology happened to come around at a time where music was looking to expand the sound a little bit. Uh, and so it, it, there was less of a time lag maybe between 1960 and probably mid-60s where we start to see some groups doing it and certainly late 60s where the doors were all over. But is this, now this gets me thinking like a viral campaign because you mentioned Columbia hands mm-hmm. the doors this equipment to go play. And so if you start handing these bands this equipment to go play with and then any of these guys get popular at all you now have it's it's a big marketing campaign for your mm-hmm. equipment oh, and, yeah. and then oh, all right. these people are going to go buy well, your that's why keyboards and amplifiers I mean, that's oh. why they gave it to them free I and mean, they put there i'm sure there were nice people but the real reason they gave it to them free is they see people if people see you playing this on stage they'll want one yeah, and I and love the music. Guys. That's I mean, this, the real reason they gave it to them. It starts, I mean, it really starts sounding like this is more of a, um, a camp, like, like you have the industry backing, wanting you to play this type of sound, 
to get people to want to buy your things. So you, like if you were if you were really into the sort of Eastern philosophy, wouldn't you be using like tradition? Like, like this seems like very much you just jumped into corporate market marketing. Mm -hmm. Like, like by as soon as you adopted those those types of uh, types of equipment. Yeah, yeah. Which you know, interesting enough, that does kind of lead to uh, question much question seven. talking point seven here, yeah. where. I, I guess I, I would want to talk to Ray about um, his, the, all the musical influences that came in to create his sound because he, he really did. I mean, there were other groups that were, you know, Eric Burden and the Animals. There were some other groups that were using organ primarily. Not a lot. Most groups were not, you know, organ was, if it was there at all, it was a, a minor factor. Most of them were very big in guitars. But, you know, what he, Ray really created a unique organ sound. Uh, unique doors sound very specific, you know, sound based on variety of influences. Uh, his parents grew up in, in kind of the west side of Chicago, the Maxwell Street area, which uh, at that time, well, still is. I think they still have some of this, but at that time it had a, a Maxwell Street carnival or Maxwell Street uh, Street uh, kind of open like a Sunday morning sale, thrift sale on, out on the street, and there were a lot of blues musicians and. Uh, it, they really became, I mean, they were first kids of Polish immigrants, but they became not fans of, you know, polka and accordion, like you might think. They became huge fans of blues and boogie woogie. And they played these records around the house because they, that, that was played in the neighborhood in the Maxwell Street area. So, you know, Ray grew up with those and that, you can really hear that in his piano style. That it's like that, 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 you know, that he's doing that not always boogie woogie rhythm, but he's taking that that structure and doing it in different styles, perhaps. But uh, okay, there's one obviously, he was big into transcendental meditation, uh, as were well, three of the four doors. And not the, Jim Morrison, the only one that you might think was, was not, was the only one that wasn't, in fact. But the other three were into transcendental meditation at that time, so. They were listening to, you know, raga, to kind of the, the sitar music. The uh, so there, that was an influence too, and that became an influence, particularly with the Robbie Krieger slide guitar. He really turns his guitar almost into a sitar in, in quite a few songs on this album. So I, I guess I'd like to talk about how those different influences came together and surf rock, which so back to surf rock, that was an influence there too, um, and of course regular rock and roll. Blues was probably their biggest influence, uh, but the unique style was more than blues because there were blues organ players that don't sound anything like this. Like Ray. Yeah. Like Mandra, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I listened to his band, was it Night? Um, um, yeah, City, Night no. City, Night City, the one after The Doors. Yeah, or Night. Night City, I think. I'm not sure. Yeah, it might be Night City. Look at then. It opens up and you're like, oh, that's Ray Mandrak. But then as soon as the uh, vocals and stuff kick in, it has a very disco feel. And and it's like, that okay. Was, it, that it, was the zeitgeist of that, that yeah. era where he, where he had Night City. Yeah, it's, you know, but you could say it's still Ray. I mean, he's, you know. Yeah, so he's still got his unique style. Yeah. The style with, with, with the iconic sound. Mm -hmm. um, so your, your question is like, what... What were some of the influences? Yeah, yeah like I guess stylistic. I'd like him, to, like him to talk about you know how those how those blended and where um, you know I guess where he combined different styles. Uh, you know you can hear some of that. You can hear. I mean, he'll sometimes take um, the boogie woogie style, which really is sort of a syncopated blues. I mean, you know, if you really break it down, and so he but he would take that and slow it down in in some songs, like not on this album, but on. Uh, Morrison on top, thinking Maggie McGill. It's a slower blues, but he takes that that what would be a faster boogie woogie style and does it slowly. Yeah, it's, I, you know, very interesting, very interesting sound. So yeah, I mean, you can hear some of it, but I guess I'd, I'd want him to expand on that. I'd want him to talk about all that, how all that fit together. He was thinking of like slow sex versus <laughs> quick yeah. sex. Well, yeah, it's a very slow sex song. You know, yeah, that comes in. That may be the answer. Mm -hmm. um, we probably shouldn't mention your sister after that. No, no. Well, I, yeah, no. Not, not from my personal knowledge. No, no, I don't think so. So, my question then 
Well, so you they mentioned the sitar. Ah, yes. And and from the sitar, there's this there's this love affair with these Eastern philosophies. And mm-hmm. I think the love affair has to do with being peaceful. The idea that these Eastern philosophies are, are uh, you know, we're all going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. And Which the word sounds vaguely Eastern. Right? V- vaguely Kumbaya, Eastern. Yeah. And I don't even know, you know, I probably shouldn't say that because I really don't know what Kumbaya means. The, yeah, well, it'll get bleeped. It'll get, I, it's, it's, so I, I, if I, but there's this love affair with these Eastern philosophies mm-hmm. with the idea, the mysticism behind them. You've got transcendental meditation and there's some good things that come out of these philosophies. My question is, is that if you think about the 1960s, the Eastern countries were large, you could say they're largely peaceful. I mean, uh, um, but they're also largely at this point, not on the world stage in the same way that the USSR and the US is, which are kind of viewed as the aggressors, right? The US is going into Vietnam and you, you have this proxy battle going on between um, two uh, bipolar, a bipolar world. You flash forward to today, you have China, which is this rising authoritarian government. They've got, they have, um, they're throwing in millions and millions of Muslims are being thrown into these concentration camps. The Uyghurs, uh, they're being re re-educated. The Uyghurs, they've already uh, done is, things. Is, is that that kids rock group? No, nope, not the kids rock group. Their ethnicity okay. out, uh-huh. and uh, uh, they're they're one of many many different ethnicities that exist in mainland China. They they should really change their name. I, mean, I think they wouldn't be as persecuted if they had a better name. That's really it, so. The per the the. the, 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 the I mean, they need a new name. <laughs> the persecution is, is directly related directly to related your, their name. To right? what your name is? Oh yeah. No. They call themselves, you know, the tables. Who doesn't like a table? Who doesn't like, like a table? I mean, why, do you, why do you hate a table? Who I, hates tables? I think we gotta avoid that altogether because there's table. like there's several ethnicities you could jump into. Hey, we're the tables. We're yeah. happy people. We we like laughter. Yeah, we're, we like laugh because we're we tables. carry things. We can so put things on. Yeah, you know, like the, the tables. I mean, anyway. Anyway, I digress. We're the periodic table. We're the periodic right. tables, right? Yes. <laughs> well, so the, the uh, we're so yeah, there's chemicals. A, <laughs> I, you know. Really? Well, uh, well, the the, eth- the they're doing these really bad things to mm-hmm. um, ethnicities, which are not peaceful at all. But but it's largely where these philosophies are associated with. Right? You know, China, mainland China, um, India is a rising power and has. It has a massive conflict going on with Pakistan and the Kashmir uh, region, uh, the, the, uh, amongst other. Uh, there's other conflicts on the on the Indian border in large, as, as that region develops, and so the Eastern philosophies don't look so peaceful today. Like you, right. you look what's going well, on. Eastern countries certainly don't. Yeah. Right. As as they uh, grow in power, uh, you got the. Uh, Burma, um, you can think about what's oh, going yeah. on there, yeah. uh, right? So, so there's all these places where you thought, oh, you know, they, they, there's this peaceful philosophy going on, mm-hmm. but as soon as they kind of get power, like the what well, seemed peaceful may not have been so peaceful. So, kind of my question is, if you went back, like if you're back in 1967, you know, do you feel um, would your if your 1967 self could look forward at what these Eastern countries become and how these Eastern philosophies are influencing authoritarian uh, China. Would you have the same love affair or maybe love affair is not the right word. Well, did they play boogie woogie? Then that would be the right word. Yeah. Well, they play boogie woogie, which is, but I mean, I don't see that is like this, but the idea that they're pulling in this, the, the these Eastern philosophies, I think, I don't know the idea that there's peacefulness or you know, like this album in particular talks about strange days. Mm-hmm. Um, there's neat themes that go all throughout this, but is it? I mean, is there sort of this misconception of what these Eastern philosophies actually are? I guess it's kind of the root of my question. But if you 
for Ray Manzarak, my question would be is if you're if your self in 1967 looked forward to today and what's going on globally, um, how would that have changed your interest or your um, uh, enthusiasm for some of these Eastern philosophies? Would mm -hmm. would would that have changed sort of your um, mm -hmm. um, your outlook on on some of this stuff? I would, you know, I would think they would. Depend on I, you know, one answer might be well. To what extent are those countries following those philosophies? I mean, maybe the problem is they're not following those those peaceful peaceful philosophies, and that you know, if they were, then maybe they wouldn't be doing some of the things they're doing. But well, that's the same argument that yeah. you'd say with you say, okay, well, any country that's right, right, yeah, say, oh, like yeah. The, maybe, the, maybe the philosophy is peaceful, country but. That, Country real politics, we're familiar with, right? Country that we're very familiar with. You could say the same thing. Yeah, yeah. The real, I think, any, I think most countries probably don't really follow their philosophies like they should. You know. So, and and thank you. That's my message from the United Nations <laughs> for today. <laughs> well, it gets back UN into why do you, uh, why do you have democracy? Because it's, it's the worst. It's the best of the worst of mm -hmm. all. Yeah. Of all the. Uh, of all the philosophies, because mm -hmm. at least you can vote out your your tyrant from time to time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I mean that's that kind of uh, that's why I asked that question. Just because they're using this, they're using these things from you said the the sitar. Mm -hmm. Why oh, yeah. play this? I mean, it's inter it's great that they're bringing all these music items or bringing all these different sounds in, but at the same time they're bringing in the okay the brand new electronic sound. If you're really trying to bring in sort of new sounds, there's other things besides the sitar. You know, why isn't there like a didgeridoo going on? And you know, why aren't mm -hmm. you playing? Like, where's the rain sticks going? You know, like, like well, yeah. Paul Simon brings yeah. in, like, goes oh, around yeah. the world and finds yeah. these these musical instruments and start bringing them in. If you're really interested mm -hmm. in trying to bring in these like unique different sounds, you know, why not do that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a good question. So it it seems like oh, there's a love affair going on with Eastern philosophy. Yeah, this time well, I think there was. I yeah. mean, um, you know, I mean, it's a good question because at that, I mean, right at that exact time, Brian Jones and the Rolling Stones was bringing in all kinds of different things. I mean, it wasn't necessarily limited to, I mean, sitar was one of them, but it wasn't limited based on fly. It was just he brought in all kinds of different stuff. And uh, 10 years later or so, Paul Simon would, would do the same thing and bring in all kinds of different sounds, you know, not philosophy related or anything either, yeah. just strictly sound related. So, yeah, there probably was a focus on... Yeah, on certain sounds um, that they wanted to bring in, and and yeah, I mean that's a good question. Well, like how, to what extent did that? And that kind of I one of my questions was I, I know they were heavily involved in transcendental meditation. At least three of the four were. Yeah, it's question eight. Is this the question? This, eight? this would be. Uh, well, I think we're up. To, I think this would make it. No, I think question eight. I think so. Ooh, yeah, I think it'd be nine. But um, you know, and and it's somewhat related to yours. I mean, how. What role did that play? I mean, I know that that transcendental meditation played a huge role in the grouping form to begin with, because apparently they all showed up the same. Meaning. Well, but we, is that like how much is yeah. that really like like the idea that they all show up to a train? So, what mm -hmm. if it had been like a homeowners meeting? Would you still say like the homeowner association was really key to bring that? Like they all well, just they, happened to live yeah, in the same living in that same area. Area, right? you say, well, the, the, they lived there it was it was key, you know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that, that, that it was key that they were in the same geographic location. They, and you wonder, you know, you wonder how, because uh, this was uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the same, you know, the Beatles were involved yeah. with him too. Uh, John Lennon less famously maybe than George Harrison, but, uh, you know, how much did that impact their, uh, their musical choices, their sound? Um, and I don't, I when I say heavily involved, um, I know Ray was sent to the meeting because he was falling asleep trying to read the book that this Columbia guy gave him. He's on, yeah, I'm, I'm getting, I'm relaxing. I'm feeling very relaxed. I fall asleep when I'm reading this book. I'm not getting anything out of this. So he sent him to this meeting where he met. He started talking to John yeah. Densmore and uh, said, hey, you know, they found they had a great, they both were loved jazz. They were jazz fans and listened to it a lot, didn't really play it, but, you know, liked some of the influences from jazz. And uh, said, "Hey, too bad we don't have a guitar player." <laughs> and was, "Oh, well, he's a guitar player. Put it to Robbie Krieger." So, um, yeah, and that that combining with meeting running into Jim Morrison just shortly before that, 
there's the doors right there. So, I mean, it did it it did have an impact in their meeting. I mean, what how much did that carry over? I guess to the music. I guess would be a, my my ninth question here. Yeah, well, they. It, it doesn't it's seem like know, maybe it had a lot to do. I don't know. It seemed like would oh no maybe that is eight. I don't know. Or seven or whatever. Yeah. No, we're at eight. So good. Well, I think that the follow on to that was, yeah, so they feel like I don't, like the, um, when you look at Jim Morrison's addiction issues later on, mm -hmm. it would seem like maybe, I don't know, I just have this idea that if you're trying to be very present, like you're trying to translate, like if you're trying to become very present, um, He's not being very effective at becoming very present. But you yeah. said like Jim Morrison himself well, just, wasn't. Well, he wasn't involved. He wasn't involved, yeah. but the other guys are. So maybe that's true. Like the other guys become very. Uh, maybe that helped them, um, mm -hmm. and and the idea that they they stay present and like you know how we want to work hard to, mm -hmm. to produce really good good music. Yeah, and and somehow um, I said I'm thinking about Ray in particular. Somehow, you know, Ray stayed very edgy. And very, you know, on the on the art cutting edge, but also stayed very practical. Uh, was able to put these things together, keep kind of keep things running, and so I don't know. There was he did have uh, kind of skills in, in in both areas. He, he knew how to make money from his art, which is mm -hmm. not which is it's hard it's hard to do. <laughs> yeah, not everybody knows how to do that. Yeah. Um, so that's good. So yeah, we are mm -hmm. on question nine. Ooh. Uh, so on the art question, mm -hmm. uh, I have one on. So at UCLA, there on, I think it was in Light My Fire, his book talks about like at UCLA at a time, the philosophy was art first, commerce second. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that you, 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 had, you, your art should come first and then try to stay away from, from commercialism. Um, there's this fight later on. And I guess that's not really so. The, so like how did we talk about his stubbornness and. Later on in Ray's life, there's this uh, doors battle between, I think it's the drummer, John Dinsmore, and Ray um, Manzarek and Bobby or Robbie Krieger. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, if they should release some songs commercially, and I think it was to Cadillac or something like that. Mm -hmm. If he goes back to when Strange Days comes out, when he goes back to when Strange Days comes out, I mean, it, how much I'd be interested. My question to him is just sort of that question. He writes about art first, mm -hmm. commerce second. I would like I would be interested in hearing him in 1967, just kind of talk about what that means to him in 1967, art first versus mm -hmm. um, commerce second, and how he kind of. In, in how um, he puts things into different categories, meaning that, all right, so you're using this bass or keyboard bass, but you're advertising with it mm -hmm. effectively. Yeah. Yeah. You, you need to put a single out that is commercially successful. Otherwise, uh, I mean, you can still yeah, produce your records. Will drop you. Yeah, your label will drop you, but you could yeah. still be a band and still play. But your sure. label is going to drop yeah, you. You won't make records, but you won't make at least with them. You won't make records. Yeah, you won't make records with the lecture. And so, which almost to me seems like it's commerce first to enable you to do this art versus art first. And if you don't like it, well, fuck you. You know, like well, like when I think my, my art's bad, then nobody cares. Well, I think UCLA because you don't cool. understand it. I think they later changed their motto to tuition first, art if you have. <laughs> I think this, this art, is yeah, their new motto now. Yeah, pay, pay, pay to play. Yeah, tuition first, pay the cashier. Cashier. Oh, art, yeah, maybe. So how do you, and part of it is that <clears throat> Cogs, and, well, that, that, but it, right, so how does UCLA deal with that, was it Cogs, cognizant dissonance? Cognitive, cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. Dissonance. How does he do with that, deal with mm -hmm. that cognitive dissonance? Dis, dissonance? I can't say that we all, all know what you mean. Like cinnamon, cinnamon. Um, and so, like, so I would like to ask the 1967 mm -hmm. um, Manzarek kind of that question and 
and just hear you know hear hear how they're hear how him and then how did he, they they kind of work through that mm -hmm. um, at being the doors. Yeah. So I think that brings us to question ten. Question ten. Unless you got a follow. -up. Well, and, and question ten again is is probably more of a talking point, um, and more of a how'd you do that or tell me more about that because um, you know, on this album in particular, just thinking specific to this album, um, he we've already talked about turning the guitar into a sitar with the uh, slide. And a lot of groups use slide. I mean, uh, in country groups and bluegrass and stuff, and for years have been using slide. I would argue they use slide differently. Uh, Robbie Krieger uses slide as a uh, to create a different sound. It doesn't sound like a slide guitar. It sounds like a, something else, like a sitar or something. Uh, on a couple of the songs on this album, Ray actually takes the harpsichord and turns the harpsichord into a blues rock instrument, which... I, I don't know that Bach had that in mind. Maybe one of the Bachs did. There were so many Bachs in there. One of the Bachs probably did. But, you know, the first guy, I'm sure, didn't. The first uh, Bach the first. first Bach the first. <laughs> I'm sure didn't. Well, all the way Bach. <laughs> I'm sure he didn't. But uh, I mean, I'm thinking particularly of, uh, of the song, um, uh, well, two songs, really. People Are Strange is where he really takes that harpsichord uh, and makes it a... Or, yeah, people are strange. Is that yes? Is that that's, that's I where, hear they call it, is that the marimba, or is the harp is harp? Hmm. Well, it it so I, I sounds like a harpsichord. The marimba would be more of a, a struck instrument, which he does play. He plays that on. Um, gosh, I forget where, but uh, he does play that on here. But um, the harpsichord is more. It's it's a keyboard, so it's. Yeah. You know, but it's a, it's sort of a, and it might be a setting on the box for all, you know, it could have been playing the box, but it sounds kind of like a harpsichord in that people are strange. It's got a, almost like, or a harpsichord or maybe like a stand up uh, honky tonk piano. It's, it's kind of got that, that tinniness that you get with, yeah. with those instruments and it's, uh, it's unique. It's very, it's great. You know, uh, if I had to pick, well, actually, if I was going to pick a song, a favorite on this album, um, it's really a tie. It's the last song on the first side, Moonlight Drive. But you're not picking. That's not. That's not just picking one. That's like saying. Well, they're all my yeah, favorite. <laughs> yeah, they're, but I'd say Moonlight Drive or and or People Are Strange uh, are probably my favorites. And I, uh, quick note on. So what's the harpsichord question? So your question on the harpsichord well, I guess I, I, is. I want them to like talk a little more about using those sounds in in that harpsichord kind of unexpected sound. context. Like the harpsichord or the sitar, or you know, and they and they were not actually playing maybe the sitar, and maybe it was a maybe it was a setting on the box that was it was not really literally a harpsichord, but you know, talk about using some of those and what other what other things did you try out? I mean, did you try out? Um, well, I mean, he, he used that tinny piano sound again uh, much later with uh, with his solo in L.A. Woman that dee 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 dee. dee, dee. So like, what is the sampling process that he is using yeah. to come up with the at the sounds as he's mm -hmm. as he's working through the? It's like, oh, I'm gonna hit. Was he just like playing the box? So what does this button do? Yeah, and then, yeah. Where you're knocking around one day, so Ooh, hey, this sounds kind of like a harpsichord. That'd be cool, you know. Yeah, there you <laughs> and then it, mm -hmm. it kicks it kicks through. I think it's worth mentioning too, as we're talking about the album, <clears throat> that you know the song, the last song, when the music's over, which is sort of this album's version of the end. It's, it's a long, it's a spoken word song, basically, but there, are, there is some singing to it. Um, very, very good song, classic Doors song. My understanding is that they would open their sets with When the Music's Over. Can you imagine opening the set? That's a, that, that's guts. Like, what do you do after that? <laughs> they would open. I've seen the some, of the over. some of wow. the videos of people listening to them, like they're all very <clears throat> just sitting down and they're staring at the doors playing mm -hmm. and they're very like they're dressed up very nice and they're not quite like there's a lot of people in the audience that are not quite sure what to do with these folks and it's it's like they're yeah. it's like it's kind of interesting watching the just sort of that they're it's new so that people mm -hmm. are not quite sure how to re, how they should react so yeah so if they play that song how did that go over to the crowd and what do they go home and like i can't believe they started with yeah, the music's they're, over they're that's, the music's over <laughs> That band, <laughs> that band needs to just no. We can't listen to that they band need to again. Know that when like start and finish, they need to define that. 
But that's it. No more band. You no, know, I think in, in in a lot of ways that's really what makes the Doors uh, unique and and memorable. And I think why they're why we're still talking about the Doors uh, is that they were not easily categorizable. They sounded different than other groups at that era. And um, you know, I think that difference really has has you know made them made them stand out and made them still stand out. I think I think you're right. I think that's why we, I was glad we got mm-hmm. to talk. Through Ray Manzarek, we mm-hmm. went through. I think we went through all ten questions. Yeah. And um, my Ray bonus Manzarek. question there is, what happened to Patty? Like when the okay. band first started, yeah. Yeah. like you had a bassist called Patty. Did, mm-hmm. did you Ray just like decide to uh, you know, like did Patty do something to make the whole band mad? And then that was like, all right, now I'm the bassist. That was the bonus question. So yeah. that was what, what happened yeah, to Patty? That's- Good question. I don't even have a good theory on that one. I, I don't know. I just don't know. So today we actually went a little bit longer than um, than we were last time. We went. We talked about uh, Ray Manzarek. We talked about Strange Days a little bit, mm-hmm. and we went through and came up with ten questions we would like to ask him. And through that process, we learned a whole lot more about Ray Manzarek. At least I did. Oh yeah, I learned a lot about him, and I, I already was a was a big fan. And he, you know, and listening to his his spoken record and reading about him. I mean, he really strikes me as the kind of guy I would have liked to have hung with. I mean, it, it, you know, Jim Morrison, I think, would have been an interesting friend, but a little scary. Uh, I could see, I, Ray and I, I think, really could have, could have hung out. You know, he really strikes me as a guy that I, you know, reminds, reminds me of some of the guys I knew back in the day, except they were not, like, how should I put it, as talented as, as Ray. So, but he, uh, he really strikes me as a guy I'd want to hang out with. Well, if you, if you liked, I, I, I think it would be cool to hang out with yeah, Ray Manzar, too. Yeah. It seems like, um, It'd be a lot of fun. I want to ask him about Laos. The, uh, and then, oh, I, he, he's probably he's probably still classified. He's still classified. What's going on? With Laos? I think he, even dead, he can't talk about. It. And so, if you if you want to find out more, or if you if you like what you saw today, go ahead and give us a please give us a thumbs up and subscribe. Um, until next time.